Welcome again to the program Harvest Feast. Thank you for joining me on the program this month. As usual, God bless you. That is very, very appreciated. Each time we gather like this to learn at the Master's Feast, it's always a great time. But before we go on, let's take a word from the, from the Bible even to admonish ourselves. And this is always directed, especially not only to believers among us, because from time to time we have people who visit, who want to be part of this program. It is to let people know the true way to the Lord, to God, to be saved. The only way is the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you have been born again, when you have become a child of God, you want to remain also in a narrow path. You don't want to be everywhere because there's a way, the Bible says, that seems right to human's eyes, but it's a way of destruction. Destruction doesn't mean you're going to die immediately, but if you lose your heavenly reward, that's a form of destruction. For believers among us, I pray that will not be your portion in Jesus' name. So, the Bible portion is Matthew chapter 7 from verse 13 to 14. There in the Bible says, Enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by heat, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way that leads to life. And there are few who find it. My prayer is, as you have come into this meeting, that God Almighty, if you have not found out a narrow way of first becoming a child of God in a true sense of it, I pray you will be one today. And if you are already a child of God, I pray you continue on that narrow path and you don't uh, go any other way that will lead to you losing the value of what you have received. And I'm not saying losing your salvation so that you can have the best from the Father. That's all I'm saying. Amen. Now, before we go into uh, the topic for today, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you. Our Lord and our Savior, we bless your holy name. Thank you for making it possible for us to gather here before you again this day. Father, I pray that... Your word will come powerfully to your people. Minister to them, my Lord and my Savior. Let the word that will come out from my mouth be that which is seasoned to touch their hearts where they need to be touched in the name of Jesus. And let your name alone be glorified. For in Jesus' mighty and wonderful name we have prayed. Amen and amen. The topic we have before us today goes this way. Believer. Have you been weaned from the world? Your hallmark of free sanctification? Have you been weaned from the world? Which is your hallmark of free sanctification? If you remember last month when we met, we dealt with the topic uh, that had to do with rogue shepherds. Uh, it was a, a topic that, that weighed heavily on my heart when the Lord gave me. And by the grace of God, we, we dealt with that topic in depth. And I believe God was glorified. We are focusing more on uh, general believers today. And that is not exempting the the shepherds who are among us as well. But I'm just saying the focus is more on everyone who is the child of God here. Because sometimes we don't understand that being called 
being received into the family of our Lord Jesus Christ, we don't understand that is the greatest, the best thing that can happen to us in all of our life. We think there's something else we can get elsewhere. And with that, sometimes we give ourselves to the lies of the enemy by copying the world or by not totally dissociating ourselves from what we have been thinking the world can offer us, which is most of the times a lie. Hmm. So the topic is to address how we as believers are living for the Lord, if indeed we are living for him. We want to see what are the things that make us as believers to still entangle ourselves with the world as against how we are supposed to live for him and for him alone. So the title again is, Believer, are you being weaned from the world, which is your hallmark of free sanctification? Have you been weaned from the world? Now, we're taking our background text from uh, Psalm 131. I'll be reading from verse 1 to verse 3. Lord, my heart is not hot, nor my eyes lofty. Can you hear this, the psalmist? Neither do I concern myself with great matters, nor with things too profound for me. Surely I have calmed and quieted my soul like a winged child with his mother. Like a winged child is my soul within me. Oh, Israel, I would like you to put your name there because that's how you can personalize this. If you don't mind, you don't have to say it aloud. Put your name there. Oh, Israel. Oh, John. Oh, Josephine. Open the Lord from this time forth and forever. Open the law from this time forth and forever. That's from Psalm 31, from verse 1 to 3. Now, I have another Bible passage that I'm going to go from Genesis chapter 28, verse 20 to 21, as uh, a second one to, to the first background test we read. And this is uh, a statement from uh, <clears throat> Jacob, who was later called Israel, when he was running away from uh, his brother, Israel. And he, he had to put up in a place to sleep overnight. And of course, he had an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ, God Almighty. And when all was said and done, he made this statement. He said, and the Bible says, Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and keep me in this way that I'm going, he was running away from his brother. And give me bread. Can you listen, please? And give me bread to eat and clothing to put on so that I come back to my father's house in peace. Then the Lord shall be my God. You see, this kind of a vow and I don't, want, I don't want you to misconstrue one, one point. Asking God to give bread to eat and clothing to put on, that doesn't mean you are kind of uh, minimizing what God can do in your life. And that doesn't mean you are all for food and clothing. That's not what we are saying. What we're saying is you have to keep your mind straight. You have to keep yourself calm and quieted under the lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't pray for things like the word our system will like people to do. You want to be indeed separated apart from him. Because when the Lord Jesus Christ was, he said, seek ye for the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto, unto it. And what the Lord was saying that time, whatever you would need, after you have sought the kingdom of God and his righteousness, whatever you, you will need to live righteously unto him will be provided unto you. That's what it means. So, Jacob was asking for his basic needs. That's exactly what he was doing at that time. All right. Let's go ahead and read our main text. Because we are going somewhere today. Don't forget the topic is believer. Have you been weaned from the world? 
which is your all mark of race sanctification. You see, if you are still entangled with the world, as a believer, you have issues. I'm not saying you get there overnight, but if you have been working with the Lord for some time, and you cannot see yourself being separated from the world, then something is wrong somewhere. So that means you are in love with the world system that crucified your Lord. That's what you are romancing with. And I pray God will deliver you because believers like that are everywhere, everywhere. So if you are one today under the voice, uh, uh, the sound of my voice, I pray that God, God Almighty will God deliver you from the world's entanglement. Amen. Now, let's move on to what we call our main text. This we are taking from 1 Timothy chapter 3, and we'll be reading from verse 3 to 10. It's a, it's, a, it's a bit of a read, but it's very necessary for us to see what we're talking about. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, I want you to listen. He is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words. From which come envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth. Who suppose that godliness is a means of gain? From such, withdraw yourself. <laughs> now, I'm still continuing. Godliness with contentment is great gain. You see, before I continue, you see, because I don't want us to, to, to misunderstand this. See, let me back up a bit. He said, those men who cause this level of conviction within the body, they suppose that godliness is a means of gain. That's what we see every day nowadays. That's the thing if they are called men of God. So they have to enrich us themselves through being called men of God. Now, see how godliness is, is, is supposed to be used. Now, godliness with contentment is great gain. That's where we're supposed to be. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, this is going back to what Jacob was asking. See? You can see a kind of a corroboration there. With this, we shall be content. That is what he's saying. God can hide any other thing unto you as God is pleased to do unto you. But to be content with just your daily needs, you have to, you have to learn how to live like that as a child of God. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. The last verse. I've chosen this long one because it's actually self-explanatory, okay? For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. <sighs> I know you are not bored when we read the word of God. We have just read the main text. Now, we have supporting text for our main text as well. You see, we give all this background so that when you get home and you remember the sermon that was preached and you go and study the, 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 the Bible in relation to the word that you have heard, God will expand the word in your heart give you deeper understanding of what you need for yourself to be able to live according to the sermon you have heard that the Holy Spirit has released. So coming up with all these Bible passages is because we want to make sure we're not just speaking the, 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 the word of man here. All we are saying is from the word of God, and that is what God wants us to do. Amen. Now, the first supporting text we have is taken from 1 John, Chapter 2, from verse 15 to 17. And he goes, Do not love the world or the things in, in the world. If anyone loves the world, 
The love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. That is, he who lives according to the instruction we have been given to be simple in our lifestyle, godly living. You abide forever. <laughs> Amen. Now, the last Bible passage we are going to read, which is also supporting to our main text, is taken from the book of Hebrews, chapter 11 from verse 24 to 27. I've taken this because it's an example of a man by the name Moses that left the world system where he was entangled. Actually, he didn't go in there by himself, but he found himself enjoying all the things the world then could offer. But because he was a man of the Spirit, he did not give himself, himself rather, to the things the world had to offer him. He sought something that was better. And I'll be reading from Hebrews chapter 11, 24 to 27. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures. You know the other word for passing? The Bible calls it in another version, fleeting. It's just, it's going away. All those things you are you think you are enjoying, they are, they are, they are very ephemeral. They don't last for too long. And as a child of God, if you indulge yourself in all those things, what happens is you lose the real thing. You lose the heart to serve the Father, where you actually have your best rewards and gains. Amen. See what Moses was doing. <laughs> Down to enjoy the passing pleasures of, of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. Remember, the Egypt is the kind of the world. So he decided to live the lifestyle of living high, you know, in that system. For he looked to the reward. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. <laughs> For he endured as seeing him, that is, seeing the Lord who is invisible. All right, I think we've covered our base very well by going to the Word of God and giving some Bible passages. There are still many other Bible passages if we spend more time. But I believe what we have will suffice for us to see what, what we are saying, where we are going today. Now, the very first question I have here, because we need to challenge ourselves and then try to understand why a lot of believers are in this position and what they need to do. Amen. Why do believers yield themselves to worldliness? The very first thing we have here is increase in apostasy. When the word of, when the pure word of God is not preached in any gathering that is called a church, I'm telling you the truth, more than likely, it has been proven, the congregation thereof will be tending the way of the world. So that is an issue that is so serious, making a lot of believers who are not designing in the spirit to become worldly in their approach, in their thinking, in their mindset. Second Timothy chapter 4 from verse 3 to 4. <clears throat> Let me see what we have here. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. <laughs> the fables are everywhere. I'm telling you the truth. When you go into a church and a pastor begins to talk about prosperity, and then the, the pastor is not talking about prosperity in the light of living the life God Almighty has created you to live for him. He's talking about material things, acquisition of stuff. You know such a pastor is either 
doesn't understand the word of God very well and needs to understand what the Bible is talking about prosperity or is a rogue, is a fake one who only indulges himself or herself, himself mostly, in this worldly affairs. And such people are liars. And the Bible tells us to do what? To run away from them. We need to be very careful. We need to be very careful. I said in our last minute, if you remember, I said there's a direct correlation between people not enduring sound doctrine and the prol proliferation of fake shepherds. People are actually making these people to, I'm talking about fake shepherds, talking about rogue pastors, people that have not been called, who see it as a way of making gain by becoming pastors. And even for some that have been called, they lose their focus and they are confused in most cases, even with fake pastors. And I pray God will deliver you if you have been called by the Lord to serve him, that you serve him with all of your hearts. You won't be looking here and there. That's my prayer for you. That's my prayer for you. You see, <clears throat> the direct result of this is the church behaving pretty much like the world. The saints among them become ineffective and they become tainted. They also embrace more and more of worldly values, unfortunately. So that is how increase in apostasy is bringing about more believers to be more worldly. We are bringing the word into the church and we are making, trying to make the word of God of no effect, which is not possible. Because whoever does that is actually bringing a cause upon themselves. And that's what we are to run away from as children of God. May the Lord help us in Jesus' name. Now, I have another point here that is very, very vital. If you were with us sometime last year, uh, when we talked about, you know, the issue of uh, bringing those who are not believers into the meeting where we have believers gathering for fellowship, we did uh, say some things about it, talking about how we are to make sure before a person joins the gathering of believers where they have fellowship, that person ought to have been certified as a believer, going through a believer's class and the lifestyle and everything. And then we, we are verified to the best of our ability to bring them into the midst of believer. And they must have been growing, reading the word of God as well. Now, what we have here, why we have a lot of believers actually behaving like the world is also because in most of church setting that we have nowadays, both believers and non-believers, they are commingled. And if I cite an example of what I had during the week, I was listening to a Christian radio and a woman called in. And I want you to listen to this. This was so profound. The woman said she was confused. She said she understands that we have to love everyone so that we can love them unto the Lord. She said she was confused when we allow gay people we will come with their gay partner into the church and they begin to care us in the, in the presence of young children and they are looking at them. And the woman has a question. He said, we forbid our children from watching obscene TV and then we are now showing it to them in the church of God. <laughs> you see, this is what we are talking about. There has to be a delineation, okay? I'm not saying... Uh, a delineation in the sense of uh, making some people to be more spiritual. That's not what, what I'm saying. It's doing things in order so that we can get the best results. So when you commingle, what happens is some of the saints in the church, they begin to copy things that are from the world. We need to be very careful because Satan himself is going to plant his own uh, children among the children of God and they begin to do all sorts of things. I've lived through that, and I'm telling you, it's true. That's another way that makes believers to live as if they belong to the world. And I pray the Lord will deliver you. If you have not seen that, I pray your eyes will be open today to see it. You see, the, the fallout of co-mingling, number one, the direct result of this, 
the meat of the word of God is not preached anymore. And you see most of the pastors, secondly, they pander to political correctness because they want to grow church. I don't know which church you are trying to grow. A church filled with disciples or with mixed multitude, just anybody? That's not what God has called us into. May the Lord help us in Jesus' name to open our hearts to do that which is right. Amen. Hmm. <sighs> now, another point that makes believers to behave worldly is when the believers, when they yield themselves to enemy trial. I call them the Satan, the world, that is as in the world system, and also the flesh. When you see believers who are carnal in their mindsets, who have refused to grow by studying the word of God, by praying, by meditating upon the word of God, something will have to be occupying their mind. That is why you see them being carnal. Satan can make use of them very fast. And we see that happening a, that happening a lot among believers. And the world is very easy to attract them. They like the latest of everything. And mind you, I'm not saying you don't, you don't, you don't wear as a believer what you love to wear. You, you ought to dress decently. Whatever God has provided for you, make it moderate. That's what the Bible teaches us how to live. As a believer, we are not to live the, the way the world lives. If we live as such, then we are not representing our master. We are not. Amen. So, I mentioned Satan, I mentioned the world, and also the flesh. You see, that is the closest enemy, if you ask me. If you pander to your flesh all the time, people will not be able to differentiate who you are as a child of God. In fact, some unbelievers may behave a lot better <laughs> than you. Yeah, I'm telling you the truth now. If you are the one that gives yourself to the, to the demand of your flesh all the time, an unbeliever on the outward we appear much better than you, and you need to watch it. You need to watch it as a child of God. Now, let's move on. Let's move on to another very important uh, uh, area that we mentioned it in the passage that we read in First John chapter 2, the other time, uh, where we talk about the loss of the, the flesh, the loss of highs, and the pride of life. Now, <clears throat> the same thing, if you go back to Matthew chapter 4, if you go and read what Satan Attempted to make the Lord of glory in human flesh lose his mission. Satan still does the same thing today to believers who are not spirit led in all their ways. You see, I want you to open your eyes very well. If you are thinking something else as I'm preaching, please, I want you to listen as a believer. This is very crucial. You know what? What Satan did to the Lord Jesus Christ in the wilderness that will not turn Satan's uh, gospel of prosperity. That's what we call it. Because all he could offer was something beautiful. Nothing was spiritual. <laughs> and he was offering that to the king of glory himself in the flesh. But you know what? Because the Lord was spirit-led, there was no way Satan could do what could bring him down. Not to focus on his, on his mission. His mission was to come and save us, you and I. Now, if you ask yourself as a child of God, what is your mission? Your mission is to fulfill your destiny according to what God has called you to do in life. Do you know what? Satan still does the same thing to every believer, even today. He offers things that we are supposed to think twice before we say we want this. Satan tries to make us fall through trying to satisfy our flesh. He does the same thing through the loss of eyes, things eyes can see that we can behold. And then, of course, in our hearts, the pride of the hearts, where we want people to see us one way or the other. You see, all these things, they are fleeting. They are passing. And Satan knows how to use them very well. So as a child of God, you have to be spirit-led. You have to be spirit-led. You have to be very careful so that you don't subject yourself to the lies of the enemy, that is Satan. And the Lord will help you as you are very conscious of this fact 
that you don't allow the world by the design of Satan to lure you into a situation whereby you lose your reward in heaven. That's what Apostle, Paul, Apostle John was talking about in 1 John chapter 2 from verse 15 to 17. I'll read it again. I'll read it again. He said, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. This is addressing the, the believers, not unbelievers. For all that is in the world, the loss of the flesh, the loss of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but it's of the world. And the world is passing away, it's fleeting. And the loss of it. But he who does the will of the Father of God abides forever. <laughs> Amen. All right, we spend so much time in expanding on how we have to understand the way we are never to live like the world and the things that actually make believers to be worldly in their appearance. We are moving to go and examine our main text. We need to go there now and do what? And do some justice so that when we have left this place today, when we remember the details of this, this sermon, it will bless our soul. So let's let's go through that passage again, and then the one we have chosen to be our main text. Let's go through it and uh, do what? That's from First Timothy chapter six, from verse three to ten. Now I'm gonna do something to expand on it. Let's talk about what it means, what the passage actually means. The very first one is this. Whoever preaches anything different from Jesus crucified, though may be a believer, more than likely is not a believer, but though if it's, if the person may equally be a believer, that person is doing the bidding of Satan. And I want to tell you, from such, the Bible says, depart. Do not have anything to do with them. Believer or not. Two. Having Jesus as Lord and Savior and being satisfied with the provisions of living in Christ Jesus, this is the wisest position to be for nothing else out there is capable of sustaining a man's soul. <laughs> the quest for worldly, this is another point, the quest for worldly acquisition <clears throat> is the beginning of the hand of many who rather than being grateful for what they have, what God has provided for them, they chase after shadows, an illusion of what they worth. And another one, which is the last point to explain what is that passage is talking about. The desire to be rich at all costs leads to unabated <coughs> sinful acts. That make people behave in ungodly, in ungodly manners. This is talking to children of God. In ungodly manners of greed and covetousness that can result in destruction. Now, let's go deeper. What are the revelations that we're receiving from this Bible passage? Number one, I want you to listen to me carefully. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is as simple as it is written in the scriptures. And not as is being used by some who like to make it sound as a self-proclaiming or money-gathering campaign to do quote-unquote good works for God's kingdom. Most of them are liars. And I'm saying this upon the authority of the word of God. If you make the word of God a tool of gathering money from everyone, anywhere, you are not representing God. Because all you are doing, you are being driven by your own heart desires. That's not what the Bible is teaching us. The Bible talks about cheerful giver. That's what we know from 2 Corinthians. If you read chapters 8 and 9, you will see what the Bible is talking about. By the inspiration of the, of the Holy Spirit, written by Apostle Paul, it's talking about how you give cheerfully from your heart. That's what is obtainable. Uh, that, that's what God uh, uh, requests from you. And that's what God takes from a child of God. That is something that God blesses you for doing. It's not something that people will 
will, will, will kind of, uh, they will induce you, if you will, before you do it. That's not what we are talking about. Beware, let anyone teach you through philosophy and empty deceits according to the tradition of man. I just mentioned that. According to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. Run away from them. Run away from them. God does not call Christians to live according to the standards of the world, but to be separated from worldly pattern and shine its light, that is the light of the, light of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the darkness of the world for souls to be saved. <laughs> the Bible says, Romans chapter 12, 1 to 2, God does not call Christians, I just said that, to live according to, to the standards of this world. See what Romans, what Romans 12, 1 to says. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies in a living, uh, your body a living sacrifice, only acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. <laughs> God created everything to be found <clears throat> in the person of Jesus Christ. And in him is found the real words for living and not in mammon or material things. Let me quote Colossians chapter 1 from verse 15 to 18. Everything is, is in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over our creation. For him, by all things were created, that in heaven and that on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist, and he is the head of all of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, <laughs> that in all things he may have the preeminence. You see, let me give you another point. The desire for worldly wealth rather than godly lifestyle. You see, the desire for worldly wealth rather than godly and spiritual enrichment is a telltale sign of carnality that leads to spiritual destruction. You see, when you don't Stay where God has put you as a child of God. You are looking for troubles. It's just a matter of time. It will manifest. When you don't live according to what God has created for you to live, you are going to be having issues in life that will let you know that indeed you are not living for God. And I've always asked those among us who are rich, I'm talking about among us, among believers, who are very clever, they don't live based on what God has blessed them with. In fact, they live to use what God has blessed them with to do what? To bless the work of God. Because to me, it's more or less a challenge. When a child of God is blessed, and that child of God does not know that the blessing that you have is to be used for the work of the kingdom, then you have missed the whole point. Because this is not your home. Hello? You are going to close your eyes before you know what is happening. Whether you live for 90 years, 100 years, you are going to close your eyes before you know it. I remember <laughs> Billy Graham of blessed memory. <laughs> Billy Graham is the household name as I'm speaking to you. He served the Lord. He did his best. Guess what? He was being interviewed. And he said, you know what? Something that actually makes him feel really <laughs> somehow is the brevity of life. He said, before you know what is happening, everything is over. Brevity of life. So I'm just telling you, it doesn't matter what you're doing today, you have to know that it has been appointed for you to live for a certain time. When the time comes for you to close your eyes, you have no option. I have no option. So, are we to live for ourselves or not? We are to live for where we are going. This is, this is an audition place. This is, not, this is not our home. We have to be sensible. 
We don't live as if we're going to be here forever. That's ridiculous. May the Lord help us in Jesus' name. So that we know, that we know that we don't live for the world. Matthew chapter 6 verse 24 says, No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other. Or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. <clears throat> we got to be very careful. Okay? We got to be very careful. We don't deceive ourselves thinking that we can combine the two. It doesn't work. And it will never work. So as a believer, let me give you some few applications, uh, lessons, uh, what you can draw from what we have been saying since. Do not complicate the gospel, but rather emphasize the need to adhere strictly to the teachings of the scriptures for godly living. Don't make the word of God complicated. Please. He said, it's commandments. And know what? They're not burdensome. If you apply your heart to the word of God the right way, you're not to complicate or allow people to complicate the word of God for you. Amen. We have to live, <clears throat> live as a new creation who focuses on things of eternal values rather than ephemeral and transient things that will perish someday or you leave behind when the time comes to face your creator. Avoid anything <clears throat> that lures people into chasing after wealth when you already possess God's riches through the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ in your life. And I'm not saying you don't walk to live. That's not what I'm saying. So don't misunderstand me. It is the quest, the desire to be rich at all costs. That's what I'm saying you should run away from because God blesses his own children. He makes them rich too. So that, I'm not saying you don't work for money. That's not what I'm saying. But don't have a mindset of trying to live like the world lives. May the Lord help you to see what you need to know to run away from the lies of the enemy. Amen. <clears throat> Never be deceived by what people think money can command for them to enjoy, but be focused on God's blessings that will not bring any sorrow unto you. Yeah, I've seen a lot of examples of band. People who have lived, they are believers but they have lived for themselves. When they died, shortly after they died, people forgot about everything they have lived for. And I've also seen believers, a good example <laughs> is the case of uh, Billy Graham I just mentioned. He's gone to be with the Lord, but I'm telling you, his work endures. His work endures. That's what we're talking about. That's the way we're supposed to live. And I'm telling you, when you live like that, not only that you and your work endure here, actually you have rewards awaiting you in heaven. You see, that is serious. In concluding, if the world loves you, you see, it is an indication of worldliness in your life, no matter how you look at it. I'm not saying we do things deliberately to abhor the world we live in. That's not what I'm saying. Rather, I'm saying we live for him, the Lord Jesus Christ, to become an offense to the world because of his righteousness. Of uh, whose righteousness? The righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. When we live according to the way he has commanded us to live, I'm telling you the truth, there's no way the world will be friendly with you. Yes, there's no way the world will not be friendly with you. And if you read John chapter 15, 18 to 9, <laughs> the Lord Jesus Christ was saying, if the Lord hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you are of the world, the world will love its own. Yeah, because you are not of the world. But I chose you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. He was addressing the, his disciples. Are you a true disciple of the Lord? A, a true disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you a true disciple? Are you living according to what the master has charged us to live for? If you are doing that, I congratulate you because that makes you, that qualifies you as a disciple. Don't live like any other Christian who just thinks 
that, you know, going to heaven is the best that can happen to them. They are forgotten. One thing is salvation. Thank God Almighty for salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. But guess what? The Bible talks about heavenly rewards. God is faithful. The Bible says he will not forget our labor of love. God will reward us, each and every one of us, for how we have lived for him. So you have to be very careful. You think because you are going to heaven, then that's all? <laughs> There's something to it. May our eyes not be, not, not be blind to that which we are supposed to know as children of God. Amen. <laughs> now, we always have this word of admonition again to believers from the word of God. Apostle Paul, in his second letter to the believers at Corinth, admonished them to be separated from the immoral, sinful, and the highly sexualized society at Corinth. He pointed them back to God. See, Second Corinthians chapter 6, I'll read from verse 14 to 17. This was Apostle Paul admonishing the believers at Corinth. I can tell you what most believers go through nowadays. In a way, uh, it's tantamount to what we can describe was happening during the days of uh, these believers at Corinth. So I can say this passage is very, very applicable today because our society has been become so sinful that we need words of God like this so that we can know who we are and whose we are. Amen. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part a believer with a non-believer? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. Amen. <laughs> Brother, I'm saying the same thing to you today. We are to be spiritual people living in a natural world. We are to be seen as having been with Jesus Christ in our character, in our conduct, and in our speech. And the Lord bless you even as you are listening to me. Amen. <clears throat> Let me move to unbelievers. Those people among us who are here to know the Lord. I believe you've had a lot that has challenged you. And I believe today will be the day of your salvation. You see, <clears throat> as an unbeliever, if you have not given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible describes, describes you as what? As an enemy of God. That's what, that's how you are described, unfortunately. Because you have rejected the love of God. You have heard me. You have watched me. And even talking to believers among us, you've heard that we have been charging ourselves. But you are yet to give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, Romans chapter 8, verse 20, the Bible says, For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. What is that saying? That is saying, you see, everything in this world that you may chase, you may desire, is futile. Because God made it so. <laughs> he made it so. So there's nothing you want to achieve and cling to in this world we are living in. Because from the beginning of foundation uh, of the world, God himself has made everything futile. So for you not to live for futility, why not just embrace the life in Jesus Christ. Remember, just like God sends the rain to all without discriminating against anyone, he has given all the best gifts for redemption in the person of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. But so far, you have been full artist as to what the consequences of your rejecting his gift will be. Hmm. I urge you today to reconsider your way and make peace with your creator. The Lord Jesus Christ is the only way, the Bible says, the only gift from God, the Father, to deliver you from the throes of hellish darkness. 
The Bible says, in him was life, and the life was the light of man. I tell you the truth, from today's sermon, whoever believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says, will not be put to shame. Quoting Romans chapter 10 from verse 13, from verse 11 to 13. For there is no distinction between the Jews and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. A, a link to a page on our website will be scrolling, even as I'm speaking. I want you to go there if you are here to give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Go there and follow the process, the steps that we have listed. It's very simple. It has to do with your heart. In fact, if your heart is already ready, you may not spend the next two, three minutes when you get there before you give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's just for you to understand more if you are not yet determined to do it now. But when you take your time to see what we are talking about, I believe the Lord God Almighty himself will touch you so that you don't be a loser for coming to this world. Shall we close our eyes and bow our heads in prayer, even as we close? Father Lord, we thank you. We bless you, worship you, we glorify you. Thank you for your word that you've given us today. Thank you that I pray, indeed, your children in this place and the ones that are hearing me all over the world, they will stop living for the world. They will live for you alone. In the name of Jesus, and I pray for those who are just coming to join us, who are, who are becoming children of God today, I pray for you. That even as you are making that decision, you make it speedily. Because you don't know. You don't know when you will close your eyes. <laughs> you don't want to go to hell. I pray you will make the right decision, even as the, the Spirit of God is touching you to make the right decision today. And I pray, even as you do that, God Almighty will do that which is the best for you so that you can live for him. Thank you, our Lord and our Savior. Blessed be your holy name. For in Jesus' mighty and wonderful name, we have prayed. Amen and amen. All right. And I will see you again on this program. Until then, remain blessed.
Jesus died for us all so we can have life. Come to him and receive life, believe on him and thirst no more. Good news reporting is all we do, seeing souls saved is our ministry, 